So about a year ago, I fell down a very large internet rabbit hole, and I'm determined to drag some of you down with me. So, just a be oh, oh dear. PowerPoint is lovely, except when it's not. So, a brief CV about me. Um, my day job, I work at the University of Southampton as a researcher in teaching. I make optical microchips, which you can see in the top right, except don't look too hard at the top right one, there's somebody broke that. Um, bottom, bottom right, you can see I do weird electronics projects. Um, I do technical theatre, so this isn't particularly a strange environment, except I'm not, not usually here with you there, I'm usually at the back. Um, and I also do other things such as pyrotechnics and fireworks. So, all in all, I tend to do some rather strange high-risk activities, which is how, how I sort of entered this rabbit hole and entered down the burrow at the beginning. So anyway, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about this. Now, that's wonderful. That's not going to work. Um, anyway, we have a problem. We are the Northwest Water Authority. And so if you notice here, this is the area around Blackpool, Liverpool area. And we have a problem. We haven't got enough water. So in the late 70s, they looked at all of what was going on and saw that there were a large number of companies. So you had the nuclear fuel station. You had ICI, which ran near um, Blackpool. You had Whitbreads, which made beer, and you had Courtaulds, which made rayon, and they were drawing a large amount of water to run their factories. And you see that there was, there was predictive um, population growth in the Preston area, so they needed water from somewhere. And the river that runs through the sort of Preston area, the River Ribble, and the uh, River um, uh, Wire, didn't really have much water on them. They'd already, in the Victorian era, built all these dams and big mega projects, to shift all the water around, they, they run out. So what do, they, what do you do when you run out of water? Well, let's move a river then. How hard could that be? So the River Loon, which runs just to the north of Lancaster, they thought, well, what, what we'll do is we'll put a big plug hole on the river, suck some water in, pump it about, what, 20 miles through the countryside, under a hill, and we'll just dump it in another river, the River Wire, and then we'll take that water out further along, pop it into everyone's taps, jobs are good. This diagram is from the HC report, and it's hilariously not to scale. Look how small Lancaster is there. So they they really nice, did some really nice top quality diagrams. So this is the essentially the plug hole on the river. So you can see that the big concrete bit just next to the river is the sucky bit. Um, you've got a little access road, and then you've, they've also got these sort of filtration tanks to get rid of some of the mud and sludge and stuff so it doesn't clog the, clog the pipe up. And this is what they put at the other end. And they built this weirdly elaborate building right next to the river. And it took me some considerable time, because nobody talked about why they built this. But it's very easy to understand when, you, when you've got it. So if you take a hose pipe that's got a lot of water coming out and you pop it down on the ground, it will spray water everywhere and it will scour away everything. And you put that in a river, you're going to end up with a massive, great big mess the other side as you blast it to oblivion. So what this is, this is just a giant tap in a cup to stop the water and capture it and dissipate the energy and then it flows under the river and just gently trickles out without really distressing the river too much. So what we have on the left here, this is a nice big diagram showing, in fact, the, the mouse might even work properly for this. Uh, yeah, we go, penny thing. No, never mind. Um, <laughs> Typical PowerPoint problem. So we have this big, essentially the pipe comes through, there's a big tap, it empties into a giant concrete trough that overflows and then under gravity gently cascades down and flows into some pipes. Um, I'm not expecting you to be able to read all the labels here. This is for all the people playing along at home on the recording. You can zoom into your heart's content or look at the HSC report and then you'll find all the information there. But the key thing is they built this structure underground. They wanted to make it look very nice so they built it underground covered it over like the, uh, with um, earth and grass, had a little door on the front, all looked nice, lovely job. So this is the um, water usage. So they built this in 1979 is when it was built. The growth in demand did not appear. Um, you'll notice on this graph, we, we do it, Courtaulds closed their factory, so they stopped making way on outside Preston, so half the water demand from industry stopped, and ICI went through a dry period where they stopped making as much chloride and they soon closed the works there. And the same thing happened with the abstraction for domestic water. So they built this big project to move all this water around and they didn't need it. Whoops. 
only 60 million 1970s pounds to about 300 million-ish. I mean, HST makes this look tiny in comparison, but I mean, this is still quite a large amount of money that's spent on something that ostensibly is mostly useless. So, in the period just before the explosion, which we'll get to in a moment, um, it, was, it was running about half the time. The other half the time it was in st standby mode, which wasn't really, they made provision for it in the design, but it wasn't really the intended mode of operation, so nobody really thought, well, why would you want to stop it? It's going to run all the time. So it was mostly in standby. But then around about the same time, they had some horrific flooding in the, late, in the early 80s. So this happened on the downstream section. So where the red arrow is at the top of that map, that's where the outfall site is, where the water enters the river. It then flows along that blue line, squiggly line, all the way through the lovely English countryside. And in that big purple circle, that's where there was some severe flooding. So a tree fell over, breached the banks, water went everywhere. However, all these local residents went, we've just been flooded. Immediately after they turned on this great big river transfer scheme, is that the problem? It just happens to be a, a poor coincidence that it wasn't, it's just everyone thought it was. So anyway, let's get to the day in question. So on the, 5th, the 6th of May 1984, the pumping finished. The most recent round of pumping they were doing finished. And then a few days later, at one o'clock, they had the weekly visit from the site engineer. So they went around, did their weekly checks, checked that the doors work, checked that the, some of the switch gears are there, checked that Randall's haven't broken in. They, have a, they sat, sit in front of a valve and go, hmm. And that's about it. Then about quarter past two, another engineer comes in, checks the calibration of the water meter. Um, I don't quite know whereabouts that sits because the, none of the diagrams show a water meter, and I'd expect a water meter for something that big to be pretty big, but neither of them checked the wet room. So the, wet, the, the entire piece of infrastructure was designed with the pipes and the valves in one half, which was the dry room, and the next to it was the, where the water came out into the trough. That was the wet room, because that was where the water was splashing around. And neither of them checked it. It wasn't on their list of things to check. Then anyway, this is where, this is where you start to see where this goes wrong horribly. At about half six, a party of 44 uh, people turn up outside because this was the day they decided to have a public open day. All those residents, all the fishermen who lived downstream and used the river, who were very annoyed with this piece of infrastructure being imposed upon them because it flooded their houses, wanted to see what was actually going on. So the water board said, okay, fine, we'll, put, we'll, we'll let you in. So they got 36 members of the public, two technical staff, and two office members there to make the tea and refreshments. It was probably even free. What, what a day we to be alive. At about seven o'clock, they did a little brief introductory tour outside, and then the group, you know, wanted to see it in action. So they rang up the control, control room at the pumping station and said, could you start pumping water, please? So we want to see this thing doing something. And then the control room, at just past ten past seven, turned, the, turned their pump on. And you'd expect this huge water pipe, water would stop coming out of it, right? At this point, the party splits into two pits. One group goes down to the river to have a look at what's coming out. Another group goes inside the pump, the um, valve house. The group that went down to the river saw on the side of the bank, these huge long concrete sections either side had loads of, and loads of small holes where the water would come out. And they saw nothing, apart from at the far end, the most downstream end, there was about three or four ports that had some water slowly trickling out. What they should, they should have been seeing, if this thing was working, was water gushing out on both sides, lots of water joining the river, everything's happy. But they didn't see that, which was odd. But these were pub the members of the public. They didn't know what it was supposed to look like. The other people who were in the other building went into the wet room and peered down to the huge sedimentation tanks. And was the water level on the other, in, the, in the weirs is about one metre lower than it should be. We can see the tide mark. There should be water there, lots of water gushing around. Where is it? It specifically is this bit here, so you can see on this, it was the water, the, the water comes out of that bent pipe into the sedimentation tank and it slowly overtops the weir into the other tank where then it flows into the pipes to the river. And you can see, they saw that that was lower than it should have been. Then about 20 past, having seen no water coming out for 20 minutes, the engineer goes, Maybe we need a bigger pump. 
So they turn on another pump. And at this point, everyone now had gotten bored and was standing in the barrel Look, does this thing actually work? And then about half seven, it goes kaboom. So what you're seeing here is from the day after, and you're seeing a wonderful example of 1980s health and safety where you've got this lovely big kaboom boom thing, and all these people with no PP on just going, hmm, down the edge of the hole. Um, you see that it, the other thing that really gets me is now, if you imagine the amount of response you'd get from police, ambulance, and everything, and then you get, what, a couple of what look like caravans turn up and a, and a, and a little portable generator. It, it, shows, it definitely shows you how times have changed. And then specifically here, you can see, so the hole is over the wet room, and you can see the doorway into the dry, in between the wet room and the dry room. And the photo I just added now is the floor of the wet room. It had these sort of metal grilly panels over it. And during the explosion, those panels got lifted up. The ceiling clearly got ruptured. But those panels disappeared. There were people standing on those, and they went inside the troughs in the floor. So when eventually people turned up, there were eight found dead at the scene from the, the uh, explosion. So a, a couple of minutes later, people phoned the emergency services. I'm not quite sure how, since mobile phones didn't exist. Um, and then the ambulance turns up 15 odd minutes later. Sometime in this period, it's not, they, know, they don't know exactly, because at, the, the, at this point everyone who was left at the scene was in an understandable state of mild panic, um, or mild to severe panic. Uh, the water starts coming out the pipes, and this is where the people who had who'd been shot down into the, in the um, sedimentation tanks had started to have some severe issues as they started to get covered in water. Um, it was about 10 to 8, the pumping station goes, I haven't heard back from that valve house for a bit. That's a bit odd. So rings the valve house, and a member of the public picks it up and goes, hello, the entire thing's exploded. And he's like, excuse me, I want to talk to the, the engineer. Like, he's dead. And they go, that's clearly a hoax call. <laughs> they escalate it to their manager at the waterworks, Franklin, which is, down, which is the river downstream from this place, and goes like, hmm, I don't know. And then eventually they go, maybe we should just turn it off just to be on the safe side. So they can get turned off 15 minutes later. So this is not a helping things. And then the following evening, and this is the bit you never want to happen in anything you do, the HSC turns up and starts having a good route to poke about. And then about six, six o'clock in the morning they go, right, that's everything we can do. It's, it, this, this entire thing is now take a shovel to it. And then later on, another eight die from assorted injuries. And if you, if you want really interesting reading, that paper goes to the ex exact minutia of, of what happens. Anyway, we're going to take a slight handbrake turn here. We're going to talk about Swiss cheese, which is the other part of the talk. So what, what do I mean by this? So we talked about something that went horribly wrong. So let's think about hazards. These are bad things. Knives, you can stab yourself. Iron, you can burn yourself. Solvents, you can, oh, you can do all sorts of things with solvents. They're bad. They, 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 they do bad things to you. And you don't want bad things to happen to you because bad things are bad. So these hazards pose a risk to you. And risks cause harm, like stabby hands, burnt face, chemical burns, you know, all those sorts of lovely things that uh, health and safety is designed to stop us doing. So we can put things in the way, we can lock them up, we can put barriers between us. However, these aren't great. They're full of holes. What do we mean by that? Well, it, they might block most of the risk, but if you, put a, if you put your chemicals in a cupboard and it's got a dodgy lock, well, if one, one time in ten a child goes up to it and manages to wiggle it the right way, oh look, they can get hold of it. So you just, you just reduce the risk, you haven't gotten rid of it. So this gives us a good way of picturing how to deal with dangerous stuff. And then we can change the names, and oh look, I'm describing risk assessment, which nobody likes to do. So the whole point I'm trying to get you to, hear, to think here is, think of your control measures as that Swiss cheese, because then you'll understand why health and safety doesn't work if you don't apply it properly, which is about probably nine out of ten risk assessments I've had to deal with. So anyway, let's play with some of this cheese, which is ironic because anyone who knows me knows I hate cheese. Um, so this white box, this is our parameter space. So every time we interact with something dangerous, we roll the dice and we pick a point in that box. At the moment it's white. This is our hazard. Every time I pick a point, 
I'm going I'm to find it. This whole this white space is the entire hazard. If we put a barrier in the way, this layer A, well, if I pick a point now, I might hit some of the red bit. So this is one of our barriers that stops me getting away. So, for example, if I lock it up in a, cup, in a cupboard with a dodgy lock, well, most of the time, it'll be fine until I pick the one time I'm unlucky and I hit the white portion and something bad happens. And you can do this, you can layer them upon each other. And, you know, they might block, each, uh, block holes. You can see here, between C and D, the holes are similar. Some, could, some barriers might have dependency from one to another. So, so taking one away might not dramatically change things. And then you can keep adding them, and you, know, you see the probability of anything happening with you. So with all these six hypothetical barriers in the way, there's only a small area in, in, the, in that top corner that presents any real actual risk of it happening. So this shows you that as you add layer these sort of control measures in the way, you reduce the residual risk. So now let's apply this to what happened at Abbeystead. So, we need our hazard. How does a tunnel that transports water explode? Where does, it, where does that explosion come from? So initially, a uh, new civil engineer went with, well, it must be methane. Somebody mentioned they saw tree, you know, planty stuff in there. That must be rotten, produces methane, it goes back. That's a lot of methane you need. It's not going to come from that. Bear in mind, this is in the north. There's a much more obvious answer. Geology. In the north, we have lots of coal seams buried underground. And you can see here, so this is, um, a ma these are mappings that were done by the HSC at some tr truly tremendous cost. And you can see that the, the dynamation outcrop is a coal-rich area that's very close to our site in question. So in this whole process, the British Geological Surveys, you know, they're the central authority for geology in this country. The only part they played in this was when they tendered the contract out to build this project, they produced a one-page summary to say, there's geology there, to some extent, and that was it. Uh, Dr. Tony Wadge, from the lead group for this area of the country, has on record saying, the charts were last updated in 1884 are a disgrace. So this chart that they would have gotten at the time would have been probably done by somebody wandering around in boots, on a field, going, yeah, it might not be cold there. And more importantly, post-accident, when they did a bit more of poking around, they found that there was lots of evidence of small-scale, local working for, um, you know, sort of individual use in the area, um, about 10 metres deep, and one was found within 100 metres of one of the tunnel entrances, which wasn't ideal, and this was completely missed by the contractors at the time. To go into a bit more detail, it was designed by a company called Binney and Partners, which were, at the time, one of the... They were about, they were about 120, 30 years old, and they'd done a lot of water infrastructure stuff. Um, they asked Ordnance Survey, who were another authority for groundy, mappy stuff, and um, they basically said, no, don't know. They just thought about, do we drill boreholes along our tunnel line? That would be a good idea, we, we know what's actually there. They went, so I'm not expecting anyone to read all this, this is the people playing along at home, but the key bits are in red. It would not be economically viable to drill sufficient holes because in the designs of extensive experience, uh, where numerous holes, numerous holes are sunk, the results were a limited value, and the person at uh, British Geological Survey thought, his primary concern was, well, do they, what happens if they drill through something really soft, everything collapses and water floods the pipe. That was their main concern. Thinking about coal completely out of the equation. This is the result of about £400,000 of early 1980s money. Um, they did a whole load of soundings and produced this map. And you can see that the, the tunnel line goes from the northern section on the left to the, uh, west, uh, the southern section on the right. And the right-hand side is where the water is coming out. Because they were worried that where it goes into the ground is quite shallow, they put steel for the first 100 metres or so, and then it would just bare rock all the way along. And you can see on the bottom of that, where the, all these sort of barcode bits are, these are where they're seeing methane coming into the tunnel. And you can see that it gets quite spicy near the end. So this is where our explosion is coming from. We've got this methane building up in our tunnel, in this section here. 
To quote uh, Bill Orr, the North West Water Authority's uh, construction development manager, there are no old workings in the area at all. We are not in a coal, coal, uh, coal area at all. This map says otherwise. So let's, so let's probe it a little bit more. The underground soundings showed that there was this big reef full of bits of coal, and there were some fissures that brought the coal up, and the tunnel went along and punctured them. And specifically, as you started putting this tunnel through, water from the surrounding ground floods into the tunnel, and it then you know, lowers the pressure, so more stuff's brought up from below, which is more methane rich. So we had this methane source coming into our tunnel. So what we now have is our hazard. We have our box, and at this point, we're throwing darts into it, and we're going to hit every time. So this is, this is the dangerous stuff, or in this case, the geology. So let's look at what layers were in place. So our, our pretense of this is that these, were la these layers were in place not in pu by purpose, but by accident. Because at this point, they didn't think there was a hazard there, so they didn't actually plan for it. So the first one, the tunnel design. It wasn't a proper tunnel. They just dug it. Uh, they were originally going to plan to chlorinate the water at one end, to drinking, to, you know, disinfect it, pump it through, drop it into the river. And then they had concerns from fishermen that dumping chlorinated water into a river might kill all their fish. And they realised, wait a second, we're going to have to just pump it into the waterworks and chlorinate it anyway, so we're wasting a load of money on this, so they dropped it. So at this point, they went with, well, we'll just, just drill it through, it will be fine. Um, so they, they had a little bit of concrete steely lining on the, either end, but nowhere else. And then it rises slowly uphill from the entrance at Routon to the exit at the River Wire. So you can see the pipe's going up like that. Where does gas go? Gas flows upwards. Our valve that went bang is at the top end. And they had the steel, and near completion, they measured the water ingress. So water was leaking into the tunnel at a rate of about 13 and a half litres per second. So about one million litres a day. You think, mm, is that a concern? Nah, it's gonna, it's, we, we're building a thing to transport water. What, what do we care about if we get a little bit of extra water with it? Great, everyone thought. They, didn't, they did gas testing when they built the tunnel, but they bodged it, they left the ventilation on to make sure they get a lovely zero reading, and a coal miner who was involved in doing the tunnel had some issues with his Davy lamp and said, I think there's methane gas here. He reported it to several people. They went, no, don't care. That's going to ruin everything. Just shut up. So we now have our first layer. The tunnel design. It was poorly designed. If it was built better, these were, there would be less holes here. I mean, it had those nice concrete steely ends, and if they built it the other way around, it, the, the, the gas might have gone somewhere else. The next layer, building design. So this is the blow-up of the building. It has several design flaws. First one. The tunnel has this air vent, so that, that big box on the left is where all the air can vent out of the tunnel. And you know, you'd vent that outside, right? That seems sensible. Nah, they rented it into the wet room through an underground pipe. So they just vented it into a room which, okay, fine, the wet room could be ventilated. Uh, underground. It's, it's got a nice roof on it. Okay, well we could put some vents on it, maybe. Uh, one vented panel on the front, a little panel about that size with louvers on it, that was all it had. So you now have no food draft either. And the door, that was airtight. You know, I put a rubber seal on it, it's got water in it, we want that getting into the electronics in the dry room. No, we could put a fan on it. No, they didn't bother with that. Why would that need a fan? We'll put a fan in the dry room because that has electrical equipment that might overheat. But we're not going to put that in the wet room because why would that need good ventilation? It's just got water flowing in it. So we now have our second layer, which is full of holes. But, in and of itself, not necessarily going to be called, cause too many problems, because you know, the air's going somewhere, and it's, you know, there's, there's some ventilation. So if we're, you know, if we're unlucky, we could, we could cause an explosion. Then there's a dead leg problem. So they, when they built it, they designed it with the capacity to extend it elsewhere and plug other reservoirs in. So, after going through the valve house, which is in this, the, the, where these sort of like tappy things are, it goes down under the river. Of course, this is full of water. And they put in a little valve to clean it. And so you could, you could flush all the crap out. 
problem is we had some unclear procedure about how to do this. Um, no, it, was, it was basically guesswork. So during standby, the scheme was to remain completely filled and sealed. So just full of water. Provided that valve was shut. Because you can imagine, if you open that valve, the tunnel's going to drain to that level. This explains why, why you saw tide marks. Um, the washout valve was to be opened periodically to remove this dead water, because it's going to go stagnant. And in a water, water system for drinking, that's not ideal. Um, the manufacturers, the designers, Binney, didn't specify in the instruction manual for the building when to do it, so they guessed. Um, they guessed wrong. The, 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 the engineer went to the site and did it like, they to attend to the valve. So they used to open it a little bit to let some of the stuff out. They never checked the weir to check that, the, that this 30 million litres, uh, 1.3 million litres of water a day was coming over the top. So we have our, layer th our third layer here. Very unclear procedure. I mean, if it was, if, you know, they, they were doing some things, they were draining it. If they did it properly, it would be fine, but n depending on which engineer did it, you would have different problems. And then they changed that procedure. So the fishermen complained, because every time you opened it, you let all the sludge at the bottom, at the bottom shoot out into the river, and it ruined the river. So they went, oh, well, fine, fine, we won't do that. We won't do what the manufacturer told us to. We'll, we'll, we'll stop doing that. What we'll do instead is we'll just crack it open a little bit. Well, when, we're, when we're pumping, we'll crack it open a bit so there's a lot of water to flush it through. And then some clever person went, we just leave it open a little bit all the time. Then none of this stuff builds up. It just, just washes away. Lovely idea. But they, when, at the same time, they kind of stopped doing the checks of the weir to check that the tunnel was still full of water. And you can see where this is going. They, this, this drains the tunnel. You can see here. When the AGC investigated, they found tide marks. One at the where the tunnel had the kink that was level with the lowest point of the um, hump that went, you know, hundreds and hundreds of meters into the tunnel. This is our cavity that was filled with gas, which we, which we now know was probably methane. And on the other bit, at the bottom, that was level with the outflow valve into the river. So we have a missing layer here as well. No flammable gas detection equipment. Nobody expected this to be full of methane. So we have no mitigation for it. We don't know it's there. So we have our fourth layer. Changes to procedure. And, and, and we have our fifth layer. Which we don't have. Because it wasn't there. Nobody designed for it. And the last one. Where does the ignition come from? So they never had any, no, because they never thought it was a high, it was an environment prone to explosion, and this is well before ATEX regulations, um, there was no good emission source control. So in the dry room, you had lots of electrical bits and bobs. You had a water meter, you had some electric fan, some lights, and you had a couple of electric heaters to keep it all nice and toasty so it didn't freeze up at the winter. Um, in the wet room, it had some lights, but they were weatherized, and you think, well, that's unlikely to get a spark out of. But, as I said, this was before ATEX. We didn't have intrinsic safety, so we didn't have devices that were rated to um, keep uh, these sort of flammable gases out, out and to keep sparks within. And then the witness accounts place a source of ignition in the wet room. Well, we don't have anything. There's one thing I haven't mentioned yet. What was very common in the mid-1980s that we do? Exactly, smoking. They didn't ban smoking. There was no sign saying no smoking here. And so this is what is believed by the HEC to be the cause, but they can't prove it because the people who were in the wet room at the time um, aren't with us to tell us. So we have our sixth layer, ignition source control. And so now you can see, now I've built this stack, every time we interact with this tunnel system, we, th you know, we throw a dart on that, in that square, you know, most of the time, nothing's gonna happen. We're gonna hit a barrier. We're just unlucky enough that sometimes we're going to hit and hit a white spot. And that's what happened. It lasted for about five or six years, perfectly fine. And then suddenly one day, it goes kaboom. So let's apply this to something a little bit more interesting, like lasers. This is what I work with. This is a bit of session that may or may not be a, from somewhere I work at. We have our hazard, in this case, big, big nice new shiny laser, five watts off. That has definitely got the capacity to blind. We have who might be harmed? You. What's the potential consequences? 
don't look, with, don't look with your remaining eye, for example. Um, that's probably the most common one. This is, our intrinsic, this is our inherent risk. This is our Swiss cheese. This is our residual risk. So risk assessments are just this, this graphic, but with a load of words that mean fluff. So let's look at those, risk, those sort of um, control measures. And let's look at it from the example of where you're going to get your most likely scenario for an accident. A cleaner coming into the lab. Well, first one is everyone should receive laser safety training. Well, they haven't had that. Um, lab to be in a designated uh, sa laser safety area. So that's a big sign on the door that says this lab contains a big laser and you need to follow procedures, blah, blah, blah. They haven't had the training. They don't know what that means. Um, you have laser use warning light and interlocks. Well, what if I said that what was going on in the lab was alignment, so they hadn't actually put the interlocks on the laser yet, because they were still trying to work out where the laser was going. And this is, quite, this is where most accidents happen, is during alignment, when the laser isn't bolted down, it's not constrained, safety mechanisms aren't there. That one goes. Goggles provided the wavelengths of high-powered lasers. Well, if you haven't had training, you don't know which pair of goggles to put on because they all look the same. One might be for blue, one might be for green, one might be for red, one might be for a colour you can't see in the infrared. Unless if you know what you're looking for on the box, this means nothing. And they're, and they're cleaner. Why are they going to wear goggles for that? They're going to wear um, plastic specs because of the cleaning solution to get, doesn't get in their eyes. And you can see, at this point, we're still reasonably well protected. There's only a tiny sliver of white. So if we throw a dart here, you'll probably be fine. And this is, this, this, is where, this is where you get a false confidence. Like, we did it before, it's totally fine. We'll get away with it. The last two thing, control measures here. Oh, we've had another chair. Please increment the counter. Are you all right? Thank goodness for that. Um, so anyway, beams should be confined within the plane of the optical bench. So that means at this height here, let's keep the beams down there. But if you're doing alignment, your laser is not constrained, so it could point anywhere. And if it points anywhere, that could be into your face. So now, you know, there's a still reasonable time. You could be, you could be all right. So a dart again. Oh, look, I'm hitting purple. Fine. Occasionally, it might go wrong. But the last one is what, the most important one. Do not do this in a laser lab. Do not bring your face to where the laser is. And this is how you have an accident in a laser lab. You send a cleaner in who has no training and just wants to go, I'll oh, just clean, and when you're cleaning, you do this to clean. Voila, you, 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 you have a very nice accident. Anyway, back to our tunnel. How did they fix the problem? So this is the, um, this is the drawing of what they did. They removed, having rebuilt the structure, they removed the, room, the roof of the wet room, so it vents out now. The vent pipe discharges separately into the air. It doesn't go anywhere into the building anymore. They added more ventilation. I mean, having the roof off is good, but you know, they shut some more in just in case the building's been in any pockets. They put a dry remote around it, so if it does go boom again, it contains the blast and just shoots it upwards as opposed to blowing shrapnel everywhere. And they separated the dry room from the rep room properly, so it wasn't just a rubber door or anything, it was a proper, you know, ATEX rated door. This is what, and then they added gas monitoring equipment because they now know it's a methane risk. So they can now, they're now actually looking for the problem. So they now have a hazard that they can see. And then this is the satellite image. If you'll notice, this doesn't align with the paper because the paper is drawn wrong. Because you can see north is on the left hand side of the image and I've had to rotate it to fit. Um, so this is what it looks like. You can see the dry moat, and you can see on the very far under the word discharge, you can see some additional ventilation they put in the pipe. So anyway, let's look at the ramifications. What happened to the guilty parties? Um, so again, there's a lot of text on this slide. This is for people for you to watch later. I'm just going to pick out some important parts. So there's 16 people dead, and everyone else was injured. So people want the people wanted blood at the sea. They were they were they wanted somebody to be accountable. The Water Rule Authority denied any liability at all. Um, and the AMP said, oh, don't worry, we'll hold them to account, it's a public body. Um, they did not. Um, that seems somewhat familiar today. It will happen even with government ownership. Um, the criminal case was dropped by the HSC because for a criminal case, it has to be beyond reasonable doubt, and they couldn't push it over that threshold. However, for civil cases, it just has to be on the balance of probabilities, which is a much lower threshold. So, no, they, yeah, they decided that the engineers couldn't have foreseen the methane. 
The civil case went, no, we think they probably did, so they found everyone liable, Water Authority, Tunnel Builder, and um, Binney and Partners who designed the scheme. On appeal, only the design contractors, Binney and Partners, were found. So this is the judgment, and the key bit here is, the explosion was therefore reasonably foreseeable. The, fir the first defendants, Binney and Partners, were negligent in failing to take into account the possibility that methane may be present when designing the aqueduct. This caused a big problem because uh, they didn't have that kind of money, so they went bankrupt. Um, they got bought out by a US firm, and now in the last couple of years, they've, the US firm has respun up that brand again, um, having, dissolved, yeah, having wiped it off their balance sheet for a while. So, in summary, the explosion killed 16 and injured a further 28. Negligence in the design process led to a hazard not being identified, so it was never mitigated for. And so they designed a building with insufficient barriers, and the barriers that were there were lousy, because they were, they were, they were, you were relying on designing something for another purpose to, um, to save you in this case. And blunt end failures, i.e. failures of management and people sitting behind desks as opposed to people with shovels on the ground, meant the building design became relied upon as the primary safety measure instead of um, proper ma management of an explosive environment. And with that, I'm going to leave you with one final slide. Um, you can probably guess precisely when in the lifetime of this, this um, tunnel this was taken and who is involved, and what the consequences might have been. That would have been a particularly nasty um, newspaper headline if that had happened.